Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, this is going to be similar to our last session where um, we're hoping to just present a little information and then really just open this up for questions and discussions because um, we're really here for you and want you to be able to get the most information um, that you can. So feel free to raise your hand and stop me um, during the slides as well. So we'll get started here. <coughs> Great. So you can move to the next slide. So I'm first going to discuss Kimtrak or Tebentefusp um, that I think a lot of us um, abbreviate as Tebi just because it's it's easier to say. So Dr. Moser um, went over this initially. So HLA, so it stands for human leukocyte antigen, and really what it is is the little protein markers on your cells that identify self um, and are also part of your immune system. So these are the proteins that will you know take a protein inside the cell and present it on the outside to tell your body. Um, you know, hey, this is a cell that needs to be attacked because it's we have a virus in here, or this is a protein that's self, so so um, don't attack us. Um, so this is a genetic test um, that's done to be able to um, determine, as Dr. Moser mentioned, this is what's done to figure out, is this kidney a match for this patient? It's the same thing to identify, um, does um, Tebby present as an option for a patient? Um, and as he had mentioned, it's associated with different ethnic groups. Um, you can see here that the incidence is quite higher in the United States and Europe compared to other places in the world. Next slide. And so here's a diagram of Tebentefusp. It was previously known as IMCGP100. And so you can see that HLA status, what's important is that it kind of forms a lock and key. And so you have the, the peptide that presents that GP100, that protein from the melanoma cell, and the Tebentefusp grabs onto the melanoma cell for, with that anchor and then grabs onto the T cells through CD3. And so that's why it's important to know um, what your HLA status is, the HLA AO2, because if it, you can't, the, if the drug can't sufficiently grab onto the tumor cell, then it won't be effective. So the study um, that led to the FDA approval of Tebentefusp, you can see this was patients that had not received any prior treatment, including liver-directed treatment, um, and patients had to have that HLA-AO2 status. Patients were randomized two to one to Tebentefusp, or, and you can see here the investigator's choice, um, so pembrolizumab, ipilimumab, or chemotherapy. Uh, next slide. And so... Just talking through at a high level, this was the data that got its approval. So you can see actually in the middle, um, the Tebentefus versus the IC is investigator's choice, and that's where you get the overall response rate. So 9% versus 5%. And that goes back to what we were saying. That's just purely based on having greater than 30% shrinkage of the tumors that we were following during the study. And so when we talk to patients about response rates, obviously, you know, 9% doesn't get us excited. Um, but the, And you look at the progression-free survival there, and those are um, curves for representing patients on one arm versus the other. Those are very similar. What they showed was that um, that's basically the time on treatment before patients had disease growth was 3.3 months for patients on TEBI versus 2.9. But I think what got people more excited was that survival curve in the upper left. And what you can see is that patients that received TEBI were living longer than patients that had received the other treatments. And so that's what I discussed with patients um, that received TEBI to say, we may not see significant shrinkage of your tumors, but we think trying to recruit these immune cells into the tumors may have longer lasting benefits to your next treatment of immune therapy. Um, that, that, that may be why we're seeing patients live longer that are able to receive this treatment. And so that, there's been kind of more ongoing research to say, what's the importance of sequencing these treatment options that we have for patients, not only TEBI, but other liver-directed treatments, other targeted therapies, um, because we're, you know, we're really trying to explain this phenomenon. If we don't see significant shrinkage of the tumors, but patients are living longer, are we really accurately measuring the benefit for patients? Um, to Bentefus, you can see on the right, so it does require the HLA-AO2 status. So it's, only, it's only about half of patients um, with uveal melanoma it's weekly treatment, and so going back to our last discussion 
um, and, and we'll be discussing this more this session when you're looking at different treatment options, um, we're tr the Tebentafusp is becoming more available at your local oncologist's office, your local hospital, but it still requires training of the staff um, due to monitoring, especially for those first three doses, patients need to be hospitalized um, for a 16-hour monitoring period to make sure that when, if patients are experiencing fevers, chills, but then also low blood pressure, low oxygen levels that they can, you can get from these treatments, that you're, you're getting that appropriate care to help, you know, fluids, maybe some supplemental oxygen for a few hours, um, and, and then that resolves. Um, but the, the treatment team locally needs to be trained on what to watch for, how to manage this. Um, and so you do need to make sure that the team has, um, has been trained and that um, they're, they're ready to give those, those treatments. One approach can be, so a, a strategy that we do in our clinic is that patients will get their first three doses with us. Um, since our clinic staff and hospital staff are um, trained and um, treat a number of patients with clinical trials um, that have similar side effects for, you know, years. Um, so very familiar with how to um, give this medication and, and treat patients. And then after those first three doses, those patients can transfer back to their local clinic closer to home and then receive the additional treatments as an outpatient. Um, and then the, the last bullet there is just that, you know, wow, I think everyone was excited to see the first FDA-approved treatment for uveal melanoma. We all know that this isn't, this is just the beginning. This isn't, um, this is really kind of the, the first milestone and we, what we hope to be continued um, achievements in, in trying to determine better treatments for patients because we know half of patients, this treatment isn't an option. And then even for the patients that receive it, as you can see, we're still gonna need other treatments. So I think um, I always present this data as like, hey, I think we're all always excited to have some um, success and benefit but we also know there's still a lot of work to do um, to try to help patients. Next slide. And so just discussing a little bit about clinical trials. So one question I get from a lot of patients is, um, you know, what does it mean to be in a phase one study? Can I, I wanna get a phase, I've, I know I should get a phase three. What is a phase three study? And so this slide just breaks down a little bit. What does that mean? So any drugs first starts in the preclinical settings, you can see here. So this means that there's a rationale that, you know, it's targeting GNAQ, it's affecting the immune cells, um, and this has been tested on tumors that have been removed from patients um, and, and grown, you know, in, in petri dishes, and, and the drugs applied to see is it shrinking the tumors, is it slowing down the tumors. And then it's tested on a number of different animal models um, and then this data is submitted to the FDA. So there has to be enough evidence to show that there's good rationale for why we're um, using this drug for patients with cancer, particularly patients with uveal melanoma, and that there's enough data to show that it looks like it might be beneficial and we have some idea of what those side effects should look like. Um, that has to be approved for the F by the FDA before any patient gets the drug. And then it moves into phase one. And so phase one is the first stage of drug development. And this is where a lot of drugs for uveal melanoma exist. And so I have a lot of conversations with patients that even though it's phase one, we should still be providing as much data as we have on that drug. And the reason that most of the trials live in this phase one space is because the technology and really pursuing treatments for uveal melanoma. You know, uveal melanoma used to be an area that, you know, we haven't seen a lot of success, so it's, it's challenging. And I think tabentafusp has really kind of opened the eyes of, um, and really um, just advocacy for uveal melanoma in general has helped with research funding to really try to drive new treatments. And so phase one, what that means is this is a drug is given to a patient for the first time. It's usually at a, a lower dose. And then what happens is, um, depending on the study, either one to a handful of patients are, are given that drug, and those patients are watched for a month. Patients are generally coming in at least once a week to clinic to get labs checked, um, an exam to be able to discuss, you know, how are things going. And then after that first month, if patients have been doing well, then we'll go up in the dose. If we have to make any adjustments, then we will. And then we enroll the next set of patients. Um, so some, some studies stay in phase one for years. 
because phase one nowadays often bleeds into phase two. And what phase two is, is that you've decided the dose of the drug, you have an understanding of the, better understanding of the side effects, and you know which patient population you want to treat. Well, most drugs for uveal melanoma, we already knew that in phase one, right? Because it was specific to how uveal melanoma grows and metastasizes. And so a lot of studies now are phase one, but really capture both phase one and phase two. And I'll be interested to hear Dr. Mosher's opinion because both of us treat patients on phase one through phase three trials. And then phase three studies are the traditional, like the Tabentafusp, that patients are either going to get um, the investigational, the, the study drug versus a standard of care. And what's challenging is for uveal melanoma, we don't really, other than Tabentafusp, that's, you know, changing some of our standards, we don't really have another standard of care. And so what I encourage patients is, you know, for phase one, two studies, we know you're going to get the clinical trial drug. For phase three, it's a little more challenging um, for uveal melanoma patients because, you know, you can see in that last study, patients got, you know, ipilimumab or pembrolizumab by itself. Um, and so I do anticipate some drugs for uveal melanoma may be approved without a phase three study in the future. So I'm getting into the weeds on clinical trials, but hopefully this just gives you a little information and understanding of that process. And that for uveal, because we don't have a lot of those standards of care and really the develop the drugs available in uveal melanoma, some of the, we've seen a lot of more promising specific drugs to uveal melanoma that are still early in development in phase one and phase two. Um, if you look at the ChemTrack example, it's after a phase three study, traditionally, that the FDA will then say, yes, this looks to be effective, um, and we will approve it. Once it's been FDA approved, that means that that drug can be given at any, you know, by any oncologist um, you know, throughout the country. And so that's why um, Tabentafusp um, is now approved, and you can get that closer to home. Now, you may ask for drugs like the ipilimumab, nivolumab, Optivo, Yervoy. That has not been FDA approved for uveal melanoma, but it has been for melanoma of the skin. And so that's how a lot of providers are able to give it because of some of the data and, the, um, and insurance will generally approve that as an option. So we'll move on to the next. And so this is a busy slide. Um, and, you know, happy to have some of you discuss as well what is it like to be part of a clinical trial. But this is generally the process. So patients will, so like at our clinic, um, we'll discuss a trial, say, you know, we're, here's, here's the clinical trial. You should be given a consent form that you can read through, go through with somebody in the clinic um, to be able to discuss what data do we have, what are the potential anticipated side effects, what does that schedule look like of visits to a clinical trial center. If patients are interested in participating, then we move into screening. And the way I explain this is these are the baseline scans. Um, so we know, you know, what do your labs look like? What does the heart look like? Whether that's an EKG or an ultrasound of the heart, we like to get a new assessment of the disease um, for MRI. Um, it says MRI scan of the head, but we, um, a lot of studies don't require that. It's, it's primarily CT scan of the chest, MRI of the, the liver, abdomen. And so that's really the baseline scans. Um, and then patients get started on treatment. Um, you'll have a schedule of you know, how often you're coming in to get seen. With those visits, you will generally have a lot of, a lot of these tests again um, because, again, we're watching to make sure that we can, we can keep you safe. And if we see any changes in your blood work, whether that's platelets, liver tests, um, that we can evaluate it quickly, make changes to the drug or other medications if we need to. Um, and then you'll have additional safety assessments that usually after that first month, if it's an earlier phase study, that those, those visits um, can sometimes get spaced out a little bit. And then at each trial will have a set period of time, whether that's eight weeks or 12 weeks, that, um, that you'll have restaging scans to reassess what that disease looks like. Um, one question I get from a lot of patients is, so what if I want to stop? You can stop a clinical trial at any point. What I encourage, though, is if it's from side effects, we want to work with you, whether that's changing the dosing of the drug, how frequently you're taking it, supportive medications. We want to work with you to try to give you the best opportunity to stay on the medication, but you can stop at any point. Um, and then usually it's up to 
to, there's certain guidelines for what that imaging shows and when a patient needs to stop on a trial. But ultimately, um, what I find is it's still up to the patient, their provider. Um, there's certain thresholds, but usually you can say, hey, you're feeling well, even if there's been a s certain amount of growth, let's continue f and recheck again in a month. Because um, sometimes you can see a little bit of, gr see some growth, but then things stabilize again. Um, so that's where it's important to, um, with your provider to be looking at your scans. And um, they ha we have a trial assessment, but that's why it's always a conversation about how you're feeling and what do we think that, um, the, the drug is doing for you and your disease. Um, and then after, a pa after you come off a study, um, most clinical trials will still check in with you um, to, make sh to see, hey, did any side effects resolve? Is there anything that's ongoing? Um, and still check in, but you can usually be getting care back home at that point. And I didn't want to um, go into any one specific trial, but this is a list of all the ongoing clinical trials for uveal melanoma. Um, so I just think um, this is exciting to see this long of a list of opportunities for patients um, to be able to, you know, whether some of these are liver directed, otherwise a lot of them are, you know, medications that you take, to be able to see the number of opportunities for patients um, because this list was not that long five years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, so, and I think that's my last slide. Um, okay, so those of you here, those of you virtually, this is a good slide if you wanna take a screenshot, take a picture, this would be a good one to keep. Um, and Dr. McKean, would it be okay if we get these slides later to upload them and share like a couple of these? Sure, and, and I'll say, you know, this was a list that we had pulled together, but there's always studies that will get a signal, um, you know, hey, a uveal melanoma patient was on this trial and had a response. So then all of a sudden they'll say, let's enroll more uveal melanoma patients. We really try to push um, for more clinical trials for patients. And so it, there's a certain amount that's always always changing as well. Yeah, and I think, I th I think Dr. Moser was saying something. Um, Dr. Moser, could you maybe weigh in on this really quick about, uh, I think we talked about this briefly in your podcast interview, but let's just kind of rehash it a tiny bit, where we had the question of, okay, like how is a doctor um, and why, why it's important to have a medical oncologist who is familiar with uveal melanoma it was because, um, sorry, I'm just going to summarize, so you just correct me, um, but... It was because there, there are studies you as a doctor are aware of that are kind of in the works that you can then say, hey, I've heard about this one. This one is, is planning to study uveal. We can reach out to them because of X, Y, Z factor for the patient. Um, is, that, is that something that um, you recall talking about or that you could kind of elaborate on a little, Dr. Moser? Yeah, absolutely. So I like to tell patients there is a kind of... Oh. Do you hear me now? Yes. You do hear me now? <laughs> it's, it's good now, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so, you know, I, when we talk about trials for uveal melanoma and rare diseases, I kind of tell patients there's kind of two categories that I think of. There's the branded clinical trials where a company starts a clinical trial and they brand themselves as this is a trial for uveal melanoma. And so that's like the IDEA study or, um, you know, a lot of these other studies where they specifically say we are enrolling uveal melanoma. There's a lot of early phase trials that Dr. McKean talked about that are kind of what we call advanced solid tumors. So take anything, but the biologic rationale is really strong for uveal melanoma. So we're starting to see in the drug development space, you know, new drugs that actually target proteins on cells or target certain immune cells. And we have decent data to know what proteins are on uveal melanoma, right? So we're starting to see a lot of neuroendocrine targeting antibodies and liquid radiation therapies. Melanoma is a neuroendocrine tumor. And so they have a lot of those same expressions. So it may be that you see myself or Dr. McKean and we say, we want you to do this trial. Nowhere on it does it say anything about uveal melanoma, but it's because the biological rationale is there. And so it's kind of those two options. There's the uveal melanoma branded trial where they market the trial as uveal melanoma, but then there's just, you know, looking at how this drug works, biologically, it makes good sense for uveal melanoma. 
you can hear me, yeah. And I'll add, going back to Dr. Moser's presentation about having that molecular profiling of your tumor is really important because that can also, um, you know, most uveal melanomas have a couple classic drivers of, their, of, of the cancer. And so that can be really helpful to try to personalize treatment as much as possible for you to say, okay, you have this specific driver, so let's match up these clinical trials for you. There we go. That's good. Um, uh, this one, I think we can just kind of briefly cover this, but it just asks, are we seeing any data on adjuvant therapies? So I know we didn't really cover those in the clinical trials. I know they're out there. I participated in one myself. Um, do you guys have any, I guess, insights or like upcoming knowledge about future adjuvant therapy plans and how patients should navigate that when they're obviously not in a metastatic space? Yeah, Dr. Moser, do you want to start the discussion? Yeah, so I know there's the adjuvant trials that are out of Thomas Jefferson, and those are single arm studies where they've, um, you know, just kind of descriptively said of people we treat with these drugs to prevent recurrence, it looks like we do delay recurrence. I think the last one I saw is, I think they delay recurrence maybe 10 to 20%. Um, so I think there may be some benefit there. The drugs do come with side effects, so you always have to ask yourself, you know, the risk balance of that. And I think right now that trial is only available at Thomas Jefferson. So there's a lot of travel. I know there was a big trial of adjuvant nivolumab and nivolumab for um, patients with high risk uveal melanoma. I know it's been fully accrued, but I haven't seen the data reported yet. There was also talks about changing that trial and making another arm using um, relatimab and nivolumab, the new leg three antibody, and I think that's going to be based on the responses that are presented next week um, based on the relatimab and nivolumab trial for metastatic uveal melanoma that's going to be, that was out of University of Miami and is being presented this week at our melanoma conference. Okay, wonderful. Um, so Dr. McKean, Dr. Moser, are we good to move on to some of these questions or do you guys have a few other things you want to chat about? I'm okay to move on to questions. Okay. So I have quite, quite the pile, and I'm doing my best to sort through this. Um, so if, if you guys hear of anything that you feel like would be better covered later in the agenda, just let me know, and I'll move it over. Um, so we already covered uh, these questions, so I need my other pile. Um, there's, I guess this is, this is just a general question for those of us who are HLA negative. Um, they're just asking, you know, is there any hope for all of us who are HLA negative? And so what would be your answer um, to someone who maybe feels defeated by the FDA approval of Kimtrak? I think, I think there's two things to take away from um, the approval of Kimtrak. Is one, I think it's, it's shined a big spotlight on uveal melanoma and that we can make progress for patients with uveal melanoma. So even if you're HLA A2 negative, I think it's been a big benefit to the field to just encourage researchers, companies to take a look and, and really invest in uveal melanoma. Um, this is really this is one molecule, one company um, that the way their drugs work, they need that A2 status um, to, to latch on to. But I think that, that list of studies, every other trial listed there, your HLA A2 status does not matter because the way those drugs work, they don't need that um, A2 status. And so there's, this is, like I said, this is just the beginning. Um, we think the ipilimumab, nivolumab, that's an option for any patient at any clinic. Um, liver directed is an option for any patient. And then all those clinical trials are available for patients regardless of HLA status. And so I think um, I see it as a win for all patients because of just the, um, just being able to see the success, um, but know there's still a lot of options even if, you, if you're if you HLA-A2 negative. Well, and like you said, that list has grown expansively in, in comparison to five, 10 years ago. And so just that, like you said, the spotlight, that, that really is moving things forward. So if Kimtrak doesn't do something for you directly as a medicine, it is doing something for research. Um, so this is a very technical question, and just let's, let's just make sure this is very clear. What is the name of the test? that they need to request from, the patients need to request from their medical oncologist to test the HLA status? Like, like is there a specific blood test or a way, like, is there a way that they need to name it and, and say? If you, um, if you just ask and say, what's my HLA status, there isn't, it's, it's not like um, CASEL or the chromosome analysis um, that 
there's a, another name, you can just ask your oncologist, um, what's, you know, have, have we checked my HLA status? Um, there, right now, um, there, we're still catching up on like insurance approval for doing that HLA testing. And so even for patients sometimes that have metastatic disease, we have to submit a letter of medical need um, to the insurance company yet to make sure that that, co that test is covered. So, it's, so your first question should be, what's my HLA status? The second might be, do you know if my insurance covers it? Um, so like I know our clinic will check um, so I'll get a letter before it's billed to a patient to say their insurance company does or does not cover it. Um, but you should still, you shouldn't have to pay out of pocket for that testing. There should, if there's a letter that you can submit to your insurance company, because um, insurance companies are, can be a little, little behind on this. Okay, so then let's just make this super clear. And obviously people should head to Kimtrack's website. Doctors should, you know, can direct their patients to the website to clarify. But the HLA type that they need is HLA A201 or O2. Both of those or just one of them? O2. Um, O201 is general. Okay. So HLA O201. And to get that, it's the high resolution testing, but... That, that's like another level your oncologist should. I just know that we've had some patients who have said, well, I thought I was going to qualify for Kimtrak, and then I found out my HLA tape is actually incorrect. So we just want to make sure that we're, you know, very clear on which HLA blood type, because like you said, it's like blood types for your organs. They're very specific. Um, so HLA 0201. Okay, so everybody write that down and tell your friends. All right, this is an HLA question as well. Can, can someone have HLA testing if you did not get your tumor in your liver or other areas of your body biopsied yet? So, like, can that be done first or independently? You mentioned it as kind of a sequence. Um, does one have to happen before the other? And I can let Dr. Moser take this one. We can just alternate if you want. Yeah, that works for me. So, absolutely. The HLA you. testing is... Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. So absolutely, the HLA testing is um, is just a blood test that can be sent at any time. You know, it's unrelated to the biopsy or anything like that. So some patients who, you know, get their primary tumor in the eye treated will say, well, can we send this test just so I know and down the road if it comes back? And absolutely, you can send it at any time. And I will add, so we keep talking about molecular profiling, and so that's testing to send, that you should send on the a biopsy um, from a metastatic lesions. Sometimes those reports will come back with an HLA status, but the, the testing on the tumor is not what we're looking for. We're looking for the blood test um, because there can be some sampling bias from the, the tumor. So this was something I've also kind of noticed along the way. So actually the blood test is the best way to um, test it. Okay. Um, now, this is a very specific, like, how do I get treatment? And we've covered this, but I just want to reiterate this because it is important. Do you get the TEBI or Kimtrak treatment administered by an ocular oncologist or by your regular medical oncologist? So can we just clarify that once and for all? I, I don't know if there may be some ocular oncologists that are trained in giving systemic therapies, but in general, it's given by a medical oncologist. And so... Um, Generally, the doctor that's um, doing your scans and, and following along, um, they're, they're trained, licensed, that they can, they can give it. So it's usually not by an ophthalmologist. Is that your... Are you aware? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> From the ophthalmologist in the room. Okay. So um, can we just chat briefly? We, we covered some of the overall statistics of survival for, like, the overall one-year survival for Kimtrak that has been released. Um, I guess the first question, is that data still growing and maturing, I guess? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying yes, that, that data is still growing and changing. It's continuing to be updated. Um, do we have any kind of indication of how often they typically release updates to that data? Often times with clinical trials, they'll, um, they pre-specified at the beginning how often they're gonna check, but usually it's kind of every six months they'll take another look. Um, I haven't seen any recent updates on that data, um, and I'm not sure that any of it's going to be presented this next week, unless Dr. Moser is aware of it, aware of that. Okay. Um, are there any um, comparative data analysis that compare the overall survival of Kimtrak with the overall survival of liver-directed therapies? Like, is there anything happening yet, or, or is that is that data that could that we can we can say, hey, we want you to compare this, please? <laughs> I know. I'll let Dr. Moser take this one. Yeah, it's 
I'm not aware anyone's looking at that data right now and that data does not exist. I think now that it's FDA approved, people are just gonna start using it. And maybe with time, someone will look back and say, okay, our experience is this, but I'm not aware that that's anything currently under study right now. Okay, good to know. All right, so this is a very, um, I think this is a good question. It says, if you only have, um, if you only have metastatic disease in your liver, why would you do a liver-directed therapy? And, oh, let me clarify. You, you only have liver, direct, liver, liver metastases, but you're HLA-0201 positive. Mm -hmm. Why is it still better to do liver-directed therapy versus TEBI? And, and how um, do, you know, again, do we have data to back that? Or is this just we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants and hoping we can figure it out? Yeah, it's, the, again, you kind of see us kind of catch our breath about the comparisons just because, uh, there's there's good data for individual treatments, but we don't really have a lot of comparison. So the discussion for a lot of patients that have disease in the liver may be, um, you know, how quickly has this developed? Um, is this some small lesions that we've been following and now they're large enough we were able to biopsy? Or, you know, from the last scan was negative and now we see a number of different lesions. Sometimes that disease trajectory um, can affect our treatment recommendations. Um, you know, the, the data that Dr. Moser showed, it was retrospective, but did show that there's likely a benefit to getting both systemic therapies or medications and liver-directed treatment. And so the way I see it is for patients, it's, it's a dance a little bit of when is the best time to pursue liver-directed therapy, which is a little bit more aggressive treatment in the liver to try to stabilize the disease there. And then, you know, so if the disease has been more aggressive and it's remained in the liver, well, that might be a good time to try liver-directed um, to try to stabilize the disease and then go on to a systemic therapy like TEBI. Um, because uh, ChemTrack, uh, you can see that the response rates are low, um, the time on treatment was relatively short. If a patient has, you know, more rapidly progressing disease, that may not be the right time to do ChemTrack, even if it's approved for that patient, and doing liver-directed therapy can be more beneficial. Um, so that's where it ends up being, there's, going back to there's no right or wrong answer, um, but there can be, it can be really important um, for the timing of when to pursue one treatment versus the other. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a great answer to that question. Um, so you kind of touched on this a little bit, but just the question of, so can you do a liver-directed therapy like simultaneously or alongside um, the ChemTrack therapy that's available? Like, are they, are they currently ever done at the exact same time, or do you typically kind of bounce off of each other? And, and again, this, Dr. Moser, this could, this could still be very unknown because you guys are still figuring this out. It absolutely is still unknown. Um, I tend to, if we're going to use two things at the same time to sequence them, just to try to reduce the risk of side effects. Because if you give Tebe or nivolumab and nivolumab and you get some inflammation, which is the goal of the treatment, and then we treat the liver, you might be at more risk for pain or something like that, although we don't know. So I tend to err on the side of sequencing them or um, rather than doing them at the absolute same time. Okay. I feel like that's, that's helpful. Um, is there, what information is there about ChemTrack being used? Like, obviously we've seen it used for, um, liver metastases, but in the data, was, was chem traffic evaluated only for liver metastases, or was it also evaluated for, like, METs to, like, the, the brain, the liver, the spine, um, cerebral areas, like, other areas of the body, I guess, mm -hmm. because it is a, a systemic treatment, so is it, I guess, is it currently being used, or has it been studied in, in being used when, when it has spread systemically? Mm -hmm. So I don't believe that patients on the study were allowed if you had active brain metastases. Now, if it's a brain metastasis that had been treated, in general for clinical trials, you need to have a repeat brain MRI four weeks later to show things are stable. So patients with active brain metastases were not allowed on study. Bone metastases, um, we can tend to see with serial imaging whether there's been a response, and oftentimes that looks at, like scar. But because we can't measure it very well, just by the, the way the bone is and it looks on imaging, um, when we talk about response, we're generally not discussing that response rate was not for bone metastases. So that said, patients with disease in the lungs, um, disease elsewhere in the body, like peritoneal disease, so t tumor implants within the abdomen, 
those patients were enrolled on the study. So this was, uh, this did include disease outside of the liver. And sometimes that can be a consideration for doing a systemic therapy if you're seeing disease growth outside of the liver. Um, so I think just to summarize, um, this was not for patients that had disease in the brain. Um, bone metastases were not part of the response, although we can see a response there. Um, but patients with disease throughout um, were included. Okay, I think that's helpful. Um, this one should be a pretty quick question, but since Tebby is new to FDA approval, um, are you guys kind of as doctors battling getting insurance approval for covering the cost of that therapy still, or is, is that because it's FDA approved, is it easier to, to get that approval? I can just say it's much easier now okay. with FDA approval. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, this one is like, I think let's just kind of interject here and talk a little bit briefly about navigating the clinical trials. And I, we kind of discussed this before we started, but, but um, can you just kind of share between the two of you how, um, how you individualize or, or um, generally help a patient navigate which clinical trial to do, which treatment to do first, and just kind of speak to how individual that is? That's a great question. I think it's Dr. Moser's turn. Yeah, that is a great question, and it's really kind of patient-centric, right? So if we have a young, healthy patient who's willing to travel, and there's a trial that's really, really good, then I will discuss traveling with them and say, hey, this other place actually has a really good trial, and that's what I would prefer. Um, but again, if you know the person can't travel due to family issues or stuff like that, or there's just not a trial that's presented enough data to convince me it's worth traveling, then we will talk about the options that we have, you know, at our site. And typically what, what I do is try to balance the risk of, or the, try to balance the potential for benefit with the risk of side effects. And that's really hard because the point of a clinical trial is to know how effective it is and how many side effects there are. And so we're still in that learning period. So a lot of times I can't tell you one trial is better than the other, although sometimes I can. So I try to put patients on studies that either are specific for uvarium melanoma and have really good kind of that preclinical data or laboratory data or trials that have really good biologic rationale. So, you know, this I have a drug that targets a protein that I know is expressed on your uvarium melanoma. This makes a really good fit. Um, so, so that's typically how I approach it. I think one of the things that gets very tricky is when you go to a couple of different places and ask about clinical trials, in general, we're all biased by our own clinical trials because that's just what we know. You know, Dr. McKean and I have a lot of similar trials, but we also have a lot of different trials. The trials that she has that I don't know, I'm not gonna know as much about and probably just inherently won't be as excited because I don't know the information that got her excited to make to open that clinical trial. And so I think it can be very challenging when you're talking to different trial sites and different investigators. And when you do that, just be very honest and say, you know, these are the trials that this person gave me for this reason. And it's never wrong to say, could you talk with this person and decide which trial is best? And I'm, I'm always happy to do that for my patients and say, you know, oh, this place gave you this trial. I think both of these are very reasonable options, um, you know, or say, actually, this trial is better. I would do that. But it can be very confusing, especially when you talk to multiple sites with about multiple different trials. Okay, thank you so much. So, um... Can you guys speak to or kind of point people to the, where they can learn about uh, the severe side effects that you're mentioning, you know, as options that people are watching in those first 16 hours with Tebby administration? So um, people are wondering, you know, what exactly are those severe side effects and how do you manage and treat them? Um, is there a good way that they can get that information? Because I, I imagine that list is, it can be expansive and very, you know, unique. Yeah, I, I envision there's... Um Probably with ChemTrack online, I think they probably have a number of, of patient education resources available. You know, for most patients, the side effects are fever, chills, rash um, over those first three weeks, fatigue. Um, the main reason why patients need to be hospitalized is the way this drug works. Um, by latching onto the T cells and the tumor cells, that class of drugs, even outside of Tebby, 
on trials, basically any patient has to be hospitalized for 24 hours because what you can see is a drop in the blood pressure. So I'll generally tell patients, hey, make sure to hold your blood pressure medications that day. Um, so we're watching blood pressure. Um, if we start seeing it being low, uh, we can end up just giving fluids as the first resort. And sometimes we can see the oc your oxygen levels decrease. And so that's usually resolved by just um, taking, you know, placing a, a nasal cannula. Rarely, um, patients can need more support, and that may mean um, pressors, so specific medications to keep the blood pressure up. And this is just over a short period of time, but those are generally the more severe side effects that um, patients need to be hospitalized and, and monitored for. So, you know, rarely a patient would have to go to the ICU for those medications. Um, it's for a brief period of time, um, but it's a known side effect that we're watching for and can manage very easily in the hospital. Okay, I feel like that's helpful just to clarify that. Um, so as far as chemtrap goes, are there dosages and like timing for taking that are different or is it, uh, is it kind of the study dose is administered for all people universally? Uh, Dr. Moser. Yeah, it, it's very standard and prescribed. You know, it's three dose levels. You get the first dose um, on the first day or first week. The next week you go up to the second dose. The third week you go up to the full dose. And then you're at that dose going forward. It's very standard. Wonderful. Um, is tibentavusp, to your knowledge, currently being used as an adjuvant therapy for people who are already, you know, known to be HLA-0201 positive, but it is not metastasized if they're in the class two, you know, higher risk category? Is that a formulated possible study yet? Do you guys know of that? So there's no... Um trial currently open offering um, for patients to get ChemTrack in the adjuvant setting. And I think taking a step back, so when we give drugs to patients um, in the adjuvant setting, meaning after you've had that primary treatment of the, the tumor in the eye, in general, we like to have seen that benefit in the metastatic setting first. So if patients, that we, can we, we can actually see their tumors and see a response, and we know it can be beneficial, that's when we generally like to take them into that adjuvant setting. Um, because some patients, you know, we hope many of you um, were cured by the initial treatment you got. And so the bar has to be a little bit higher from a side effect and benefit standpoint. And so that's where you'll see most times drugs that have been tested for patients with metastatic disease then taken into the adjuvant setting. So there's a lot of... Um, drugs in that metastatic setting that there's a lot of conversations and I think planning for clinical trials um, ongoing, but currently no open trials. Okay, so people just, you know, we need to just stay in the, in the know and, and we can of course um, continue staying in contact, like that's part of our job here at Acure Insight is we stay in contact with you guys to make sure that we understand what is going on and when and how to make sure that we're all aware of it. Um, so this last, uh, I guess, question or so is more to do with the clinical trials and kind of navigating this sphere. Um, because like you said, the, there is not a, a lack of these clinical trials at the moment. So um, I guess this one question is, do you, how do you um, help a patient who maybe is outside of, or how would a medical oncologist um, outside of our country, so maybe in Canada or the UK, who wants to come here for a US clinical trial, is that possible to your knowledge or is it very US based because they're US clinical trials? Dr. Moser. Yeah, they can absolutely come here. <clears throat> I think we all have patients who will travel for trials. The, um, you know, the thing is, a lot of sites will try to negotiate some travel stipends for patients who are on trials because we know the traveling and the time commitment is a burden. And so it's really just that person kind of working with um, either a nurse navigator at a clinical trial site or with a patient advocacy group or the study directly to try to find a site that has the availability to see them and potentially has some support in them traveling or housing or something like that. But it's absolutely possible. Okay, and um, Dr. McKean, you mentioned in your data as you kind of presented about phase one, phase two, the, the clinical trial progression, um, you mentioned that sometimes those phase ones bleed into phase two. So can you just kind of clarify, does that mean that some of the patients um, any, anyone who does well, I guess, in the phase one of the study would then be moved to phase two, or do they take a whole new round of patients for phase two and the phase one stop? Yeah, good question. So if you get started on a clinical trial, regardless of what, if it's phase one or phase two, and you're benefiting 
you stay on it. Almost any clinical trial is designed so that even if a trial closes, because there hasn't been benefit for a significant number of patients, if you individually are benefiting, then you can stay on and continue receiving that drug. When I say they bleed from phase one into phase two, most studies now, like I said, a phase two means they've decided on a dose in the specific patient population. Well, a lot of these studies kind of know early on that this looks like a good option for patients with uveal melanoma. So they've written the initial protocol or kind of instructions that we follow that once we've decided on a dose, then we're gonna enroll more patients with uveal melanoma. And so that, that's kind of a phase 1B um, part of the study. But all that to say, they're trying to kind of speed up development by just yeah. planning it from the beginning as opposed to closing the study and then reopening it as a phase 2, if that okay. makes more so sense. That sounds like a much more um, sophisticated and rapid way to, to make it happen and to make sure that patients are able to get treatment more quickly. Correct. Okay, so I, I do want to just point out or ask you guys, do you as medical oncologists, do your, do your practices have like a, a clinical trial research nurse or a nurse navigator who can help, um, who helps in addition to what you guys do in this conversation with the patients of deciding, okay, what do we do? But once they maybe decide on that trial, um, are there typically nurse navigators within the trials or within your practice who would be helping that patient navigate things like travel and, you know, getting, getting to the right place, managing the side effects, all of those kind of key pieces? Uh, Dr. Moser? Yeah, absolutely. I think any good clinical trial site will have clinical trial nurse navigators who will help with the, you know, getting all the information, figuring out what you need to do to get into the clinic. Once you're in the clinic, the, your nurse navigator will become your research nurse, but definitely everyone has a team of nurse navigators that, um, that can help get you in and answer those initial questions about what are the trials, is it worth coming, and stuff like that. Okay, wonderful. So I think that this question would be a good one to end on, just to kind of help kind of reel us back in. We've talked about a lot of different things. Um, generally, we were talking about ChemTrack in this, in this session. And the question here is, are you telling me that the overall survival of ChemTrack is only one year? Um, so can we just kind of reiterate again that the data is, you know, the data is still changing and, and to keep on the lookout for that. And that just because it's, I mean, I, my understanding is just because it says the overall survival is one year doesn't mean that that's the only data that we're ever seeing. That's just kind of the, the average. Is that correct? Correct. And if you, um, I can't remember exactly what year they started this study, but it was several years ago, right? And we've talked about how um, there's more and more clinical trials available, um, and you know we're we're making more progress. That we're, while we're presenting the data now, these were patients that were enrolled. I think. Uh, like five years ago, um, even longer than that. And so we're really hopeful that we're, we're making more progress to helping patients live longer now with a combination of liver-directed therapy, maybe um, ChemTrack, and then clinical trial opportunities. Okay, I think that was great. Um, Dr. Moser, do you have anything you want to say as we wrap up? Uh, nope. All right. <laughs> nope. All right. Well, thank you both for being here. Thank you guys for all of your questions. I have a wonderful pile over here, and, um, and I'm going to do my best to just keep track of these, and, um, and we're going to continue on with our next session. So Dr. McKean, Dr. Moser, thank you so much for two hours of your time today. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks.